And if you're a runner, you can sign up for the 5K and go to church because the race is at 1010. Uh, so you could come to church at 9, run a 5K, or run a 5K and then come to church at 11. Uh, just make sure you finish on time. So that's motivation uh, to finish. Uh, so here we are. Uh, let's pray. Uh, God, I, Lord, I thank you um, for the inability to change lives. Father, I thank you, Lord, that in human effort, everything that happens here in this building is in vain. Um, and so, Father, we need you. God, we, um, it's not that we invite you because you are here, you are present, but Father, we do ask, Lord, that you empower, that you shine through, that you move through, Father, that anything that is said or saying from this stage, Lord, would, would it bring you honor and glory? Father, when, when the words and the songs and, and everything that is, is, is presented from this stage, Lord, and goes into somebody's ears and, and, and is into somebody's mind, Father, would you use that to change lives as only you can? Um, and so, Father, this whole time is for your glory and for your purposes, and we love you and we give it all to you in your name. Amen. Uh, so some things that we've been saying, we're in this series on end times, looking at uh, what the Bible has to say about what is to come, and uh, there's a whole lot of areas that we can disagree on, uh, and people do. Uh, there's a lot of people that will debate these things and make up YouTube videos or write blogs or whatever, but we have said, hey, we're going we're gonna to share our vantage point, but there are going to be three things that we think that we all should agree with, uh, and the three things are up on the screen. Jesus is coming back. Uh, we don't know when, and we need to be ready. Uh, people uh, that are students of God's word, I have not found very many people uh, that would disagree with one of those three things. By and large, people do agree uh, with that. By and large, people have seen this picture. Have you seen this picture, or did you see it, see it live? Uh, anybody remember that from a few, uh, few months ago? Uh, I mentioned it to Ava because Will Smith started in, getting back on social media, I think, this past week. Uh, she was like, yeah, it's the slap heard around the world. And I was like, what does that even mean? Like, what, what world do we live in where that, that happens? And, uh, and I, so I Googled that this week. Uh, and Google, if you type in Chris Rock slaps or Will Smith slaps Chris Rock, uh, you know how many results you get back? How many YouTube videos and blogs and articles have been written about this one event? Over 16 million blogs, videos, articles have been said and written of this. And if you don't, if you didn't watch it, it was uh, I think it was the Grammys or the whatever it was. And uh, Chris Rock, a comedian, was making jokes, and Will Smith took offense and walked up on stage like any mature individual and slapped him. Uh, and uh, and then took a re took a, grabbed an award and cried during it. Uh, but Will Smith uh, uh, since then has kind of been in hiding, and some conspiracy theories have come up that uh, that you could look and you can examine, and then people who say, well, in articles or videos, well, look, the skin tones are different, or look, there must be a fake hand, or look, uh, there was a cheek pad, or look, it was staged, or look, the Academy put them up to this to boost the weight ratings. There was all of these articles and videos that you can find of, I gotcha. I'm looking at this event and I'm looking at it and I'm trying to get the, I gotcha, I, I figured all this out, but you know how many went to the actual source? <laughs> None. <laughs> very, very few went directly to Chris Rock. Very, very few went directly to Will Smith. All of it was how they analyzed it and what they thought of the situation. And that is, in, that is human nature. When something big happens or something uh, will, big will happen, we begin to overanalyze and to assume. We look for the story behind the story, all while missing the actual story. And we do this with Jesus in the end times. We think about what is to come and we seek truth from outside of Jesus and then we begin to hate Jesus and blame Jesus. Do, do, do you catch that in our human nature? We hate Jesus with what is to come without ever consulting Jesus. <laughs> And so today, I want to look at God's word. I want to see what Jesus himself said in our investigation of the end times. And I want us to consider his actual words. And as we consider them, I want us to realize what a gift this actual moment is. 
And so we're going to be in the book of Matthew. Uh, you can scan through the Old Testament. When you get to the New Testament, it starts with Matthew. And if you hit uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, then you've gone too far. But Matthew is a tax collector turned follower of Jesus. Somebody who was hated by the general public became a follower of Jesus and, and wrote an eyewitness account. And so here is one of his accounts, uh, one of his, his account of this moment in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, uh, then will, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So very basic principle. The disciples, like of, many of us that come into this room, they are confused, they are curious, and where do they go? They go directly to Jesus. A different motivation than what we saw with the Pharisees the week before. They're going to Jesus. And so our big thought for this experience is very, very simple. You must examine Jesus in your end times investigation. You cannot conclude something about the way this world ends without consulting Jesus. As you investigate, as you research, all roads have to go through Jesus. And so what we'll see in these next few verses uh, are three elements uh, to our end times investigation, what Jesus provides for us. The first one, and this is where if there's going to be a moment that gets super complicated in the whole series, <laughs> take out your phones, take notes. Uh, this is where some stuff gets complicated. Actually, it'll be on the screen. So just take out your phones and take pictures. Uh, so that will be easy. Uh, first thing is that uh, Jesus provides the signs. Here's what Jesus answered them. See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in, the, in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Uh, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. Uh, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Uh, and there will be famines and earthquakes in, in various places. And all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. And then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by the nations for my name's sake. And, and then many will fall away and betray for one another and, uh, and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise and lead many astray. And, 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 because law, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Jesus just gave us a mouthful. <laughs> they ask for signs, and Jesus right here gives six signs to the end of days. Last week, we looked at the rapture, which we think uh, is, uh, is the spark to all of this that the church will be taken and, and Christians will, well, Jesus will, will call all the church home and, and the Christians will vanish from this earth and be uh, with Jesus instantly uh, in heaven. Uh, and then we'll spark seven years of tribulation. And what Jesus is talking about right here are signs of the tribulation. And so he gives this first sign. There will be widespread deception of a growing number of false Christ, people that claim to be godly. People that claim to be Christ's representatives, but they will have pure evil in mind. Before this, because of the rapture, the Holy Spirit right now is working through the church. And so that actually helps the world keep a level of goodness. Once the Holy Spirit departs through, through the church being departed, lawlessness will increase. Antichrist and, and many Christs will have their way with humanity claiming to be doing good, but having their way in, 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 uh, in evil. If you, when, you, when you use the phrase, all hell has broken loose, with the departure of the church, this is a time where all literal hell will literally break out on the earth. The second sign of the end of times is that an international dispute that will intensify among the nations of the world. Before Jesus comes back to judge and to be king of this world, that there will be massive wars between all the kingdoms. But the focus will be the Middle East. And this will likely include economical. Uh, this will be cold war. This will be political. This will be combat and bloodshed. A third of the population will likely die. This will be a, a holocaust like we have never seen. A dispute, a worldwide war uh, with a, a focus on the Middle East. The third sign is that the end involves the proliferation of famines, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. And we're not trying to get political here. But global warming might actually be a thing because the end of days talks about how the world itself self-destructs. 
Forget the wars, forget the political turmoil and widespread, all of that, but there will be famines, there will be earthquakes of staggering proportions. And as the world begins to disintegrate, the fourth sign is that at the end, the believers will experience severe persecution for those who, uh, from those who hate Christ. These are people known as tribulation saints. They will be the targets of persecution because they're not identifying with an antichrist, a major political figure that uh, first appears to be good, and we'll get to that in a second, but because they don't want to uh, ascribe themselves or, or, or affiliate themselves with the antichrist, they will become targets for the rest of humanity. They will be hunted, they will be hated, they will be arrested, they will be killed, they will be persecuted like like unlike any other time that the world has ever seen. The fourth sign many supposed Christians will defect. There'll be people that, that say yes to a relationship with Jesus uh, during the tribulation, uh, but, and some of them will fake, uh, fake a response to Jesus, and some, a few of them, a handful of them, will be uh, genuinely saved. This will be a, a, the, a, they were, but in this moment when the tribulation breaks out, they will defect. They will run from the God that at the beginning they say, I'm, a, I'm ascribing to, but why will they run? Jesus gave us three raisins because the price is too high. Once the perse persecution uh, uh, sparks up, these Christians that will say, hey, I, I ascribe to Jesus. Now all of a sudden when they see people die, they will run from the God that they, want to, that they said they wanted to serve. Or the deception of the false prophets, the people that are trying to convince them. Otherwise, they will, excuse me, they will fall to that. And the third is that sin will simply be so attractive. When the church is raptured and the Holy Spirit it, it, it takes a different role there, sin will just look like commonplace, great, and attractive. People won't care about what they say. People won't care about sexual sin. People will just simply, all of that will just be common in all of, all of society. And these Christians, these people that, that were claiming the name of Jesus, when they see others flaunting sin, they will want it just like the rest of the world. And lastly, and this is most importantly, the world, worldwide declaration of the gospel. That despite all the hardships of the seven years of tribulation, all the horrors, all, all, all that is going on, that Jesus will still be proclaimed to all the nations, that my Jesus will not be out without witness even in the end of days. I've joked with you guys before that on, on, I write these sermons on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, and so uh, there are now people from uh, uh, one person in particular that jokes with me all the time how he will not talk to me on a Monday or a Tuesday. Uh, and so uh, I was literally writing this exact section. You can see this in the video. I'm going to show you here in a second. Writing this exact section on Monday at 3 o'clock. Uh, and my friend was giving me warning signs that he wanted something to change. And, and so just check out this video real fast. I had to capture it. I could have taken that video for 45 seconds. It will still go on. I, the second... What's wrong? The second, around three or four o'clock, Bruin will get into my face. He'll start panting and breathing. His breath is super hot and super smelly. And in a second, I say, uh, uh, Brady, Reagan, he all of a sudden does that because he knows it's dinner time. I, like, I am working on a sermon on a Monday afternoon. I literally like lose track of time. But every time I see Bruin get all up in my business, I simply know it is around three or four o'clock. And I just have to say, Br uh, Brady. And all of a sudden, Bruin will go berserks looking for his food. It's a, a built-in sign. And, and what I say that to say, <laughs> it's a sign that tells me something is going on. When I look at all of these end time things, all of these signs of what are to be, does any of it really actually seem that far-fetched? It seems super drastic, right? Like we're mentioning like worldwide destruction. But is it that far-fetched to think the, world, the, the nations of this world would fight against each other? Does it seem that far-fetched that the world might actually uh, be falling, the physical world might actually be falling apart? Does it seem that far-fetched that Christians will be under in increasing uh, tr like crazy amounts of persecution? Does, it, does, it, does, does the, the signs that Jesus mentions here, 
When I sat back and thought about it, it really is, you know what? It doesn't seem that unreasonable anymore. And so as I think about the signs to come, it informs my perspective on the present. What I learn from the signs to come are that nations will never learn to play nice. What I learn from the signs to come is that evil will only increase. What I learn from the signs to come is that defecting Christians caring about their comfort will always be a thing. What I learn from the signs to come are that hardships within this world, both physically and for Christians, will intensify. But what I also learn, despite the signs to come, is that there's a job to do now and there's a job to do then. Proclaim the name of Jesus because he's the only hope for this world. The second sign that Jesus provides for us, the second aspect that he provides us, is he provides deeper studies. He says this, so when, the, uh, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So here, and go, to that, go to that timeline for a second. This is the timeline of what we are working on. Uh, and you can also see this in the weekly rundown. We'll get to that in a second. Last week, we talked about rapture. This week, we're talking about seven years of tribulation. My dad is watching. He's an end times expert. So dad, I hope you're taking notes. Uh, and so right in the middle of, of, of the tribulation, it's going to start off with three and a half years, what seems like peace. Hey, the church got raptured, but you know what? The world seems to be doing all right. There will be a figure right in the middle called the Antichrist that will appear to be a friend to Israel, appear to be Israel's friend. But right there in the middle, he's a friend that becomes an enemy. And he brings destruction. And the world starts to turn upside down with Israel being at the focal point. And what Jesus is saying here is is what he also references in, in his triumphal entry, if only you would have known. Because you can go back to the the book of Daniel and you can see Daniel also gives prophecy. And in that prophecy about these 70 weeks that you could look at the calendar, you could look at the the Hebrew calendar, you could look at the times and you could take those 70 weeks and and Artaxerxes and then you could take and you could measure it out where you could could get to actually the triumphal entry as well. You could actually uh, get to uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and you can get to the start of the tribulation. You You can find your way mathematically to all of those things if only you would have known. If only you would have studied. And it's, it's deeper, and it can, be, it can be confusing, and in the middle of that is great slaughter, and in the middle of that are things that you and I should at some level be aware of. And so I want to hear, on the, uh, Graham took this video this morning. If you were to go take that keychain, go to the weekly rundown. This is what you get to, uh, wellspring.one slash weekly. You go to a button called Sermon. Uh, and then it pulls up this exact timeline. You go, you see everything about the sermon, but then you get to the bottom and there are deeper studies there where you can go decoding the 70 weeks. Uh, what are the 70 weeks for you this week to dig deeper into that and study what it means. And as you study it, and as you see that time is ticking, you should also know that because time is ticking, that this moment is a gift. There was a movie that I watched growing up, and uh, I don't know how old it is. It's probably wildly dated. Uh, but In Search of Bobby Fischer, it's a, it's a chess movie. Uh, it's, uh, and I was like, I was like, well, can we watch something about sports? And my, I was like, no, we're going to watch a movie about chess. And I was like, okay, great. I'm D's get degrees, so thanks, Dad. And, uh, and so, but in the middle of this movie, this guy who's just In Search of Bobby, like this guy that's super, super smart is playing another kid. And, uh, and check, out, check out this scene. You've lost. You just don't know it. I've lost. Look at the board. I have. Take the draw, and I'll share the championship. Take the draw. Move.
Check. Landon, you can go to that next slide okay. now. It's this moment, and I bought a chess clock. I've literally never searched even for this until this week. And uh, I tried finding one of those loud ones. Uh, those were more expensive. And so uh, $11 on Amazon got us this. And uh, it really did make me think about we're talking about things that, that isn't fun. Like, it's not fun to talk about all of this. Uh, to, you know, if you were to go and say, hey, what are you doing this morning? Well, I'm going to go to the church and preach about tribulation. <laughs> oh, it sounds like a party. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and I'm not trying to scare you to Jesus. One of the elders uh, said that to me while we were talking about this series, was we're not trying to scare people to Jesus. <laughs> but what I do want you to see as we talk about this <laughs> As we mention these deeper studies in 70 weeks and abomination of desolation and, and all of these signs and destruction and an antichrist and all these words that many of us haven't even heard before. And as we're talking about all of this chaos, what I, what I want you to see is that Jesus, because you have this moment as a gift, is in essence reaching his hand across the table and saying, I'm offering you something. I'm offering you a a way out of all of this? And will you take it? <laughs> Do you see Jesus as a friend? You might say, Jason, I'll just wait. You know, if you're talking about rapture and my crazy wife is, is like saying all this stuff about Jesus or my crazy husband is saying this or my crazy neighbor is saying this or my crazy co-worker has said this about Jesus and I just want to keep ignoring, keep ignoring, if, if she or he or whatever all of a sudden disappears, then I will take it seriously. Sure, play those odds. But here's what I also know. The persecution and the suffering that you and I face as Christians in this moment is nothing in comparison to what it will be. So will you say yes to Jesus right now? Because right now is truly the best time. Jesus goes on to provide us a snapshot of what it will be like in that day. He tells this, uh, not story, but this to, to paint the picture, provides a snapshot. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is at the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back for his cloak. Alas, and women who are pregnant, and, and for those who are, are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight might not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for, the, for there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And in those days... Had it not been cut short, no human being would be saved. Praise God, Jesus will return. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here, there he is, do not believe it. For the false Christ and the false prophets will rise up and perform great signs, great wonders. So to what? Lead people astray. And if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if I say to you, look, uh, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. When this abomination of desolation happens in the middle of that seven-year tribulation, and, and when the Antichrist himself has a headquarters in Jerusalem, Jesus is saying there is immediate danger because of your proximity to Jerusalem. And when that comes, there is no time for anything but running. Nothing will be worth it except for getting out of that time. And in that moment, we'll talk about the Antichrist and what is to come in that moment, uh, that there will be a holocaust and a persecution on Israel like humanity has never seen before. Two-thirds of the Jewish population will die. 
What Jesus is talking about is if you better pray you're not pregnant because you will not be able to move fast enough. You better pray it is not winter because that will make it harder. You better pray it's not on the Sabbath because legalistic Jews will try to keep you from running and moving on the Sabbath when you need to get to going. But all of this is marked with great hope because Jesus will return. And there will be that final battle that my Jesus will win. And so again, this moment is a gift. What will you do with it? Are you doing your research? Perhaps that is why you are here. Praise God for that. But now what would you do with that information? My daughter broke her arm while we were on vacation. I did not win dad of the year while we were on vacation because I led my daughter uh, to danger. We were hiking. I said, let's love the family. Let's go on a nice hike. They were so great to do that on my birthday. Uh, and so uh, my daughter broke her hand, uh, on, her arm on my birthday because well, I'm, I didn't read. Uh, this is a, a picture of All Trails. It's an app that you can use for hiking. It's a great app. Uh, and if, you, if you're a hiker in the room, I'm sure you have used it. I'm taking a group of people uh, to New Hampshire uh, the later this week, and we're going to hike uh, Flume and Liberty. It gives you a map. It gives you all these things. And when you click on one of the hikes, you can read all of the reviews. Uh, I read this. Uh, we hiked Mount Cannon. Uh, it's a ski mountain, so I figured it must be an easy hike. Uh, it's a 4,000-footer. My family was going to do it. I watched a YouTube video of a family and about 2015 that had done it and they said it was easy and that they could do it. They had kids roughly my kids age and I was like, oh, this is going to be to be great. I saw a five minute video that captured their six hour hike and thought this is going to be great. Uh, and so we hike. My daughter jumps from one rock to another rock and, and, and lands on her wrist, and there was a compression uh, break. It, it really, she, she, she broke it, uh, but even the doctor was like, she doesn't really appear to be broken as she's bouncing around the doctor's office. Uh, she was, for all practical purposes, fine, uh, but still had that, that cut, uh, not the cut, but the break around it, and so she's in a cast till, not a cast, she's in a splint, uh, really, until next week. But the point being is, when we left that mountain, I was like, man, that was a lot harder than uh, that video uh, had led on to be. My, my wife started reading all the reviews of said mountain that were right in the app <laughs> that I was using to guide us <laughs> around this trail. <laughs> and they said, oh, we lost funding. Uh, some of the reviewers said they lost funding. They haven't been able to maintain the trail for the last year. <laughs> and so it was eroding. Uh, uh, there were some that were saying how hard of a hike it was. Uh, there was a whole lot of information in the reviews of the hike, uh, literally at my fingertips, <laughs> that I could have read. <laughs> but I watched a five-minute video and thought, this is going to be perfect for my family. And it wasn't. <laughs> in the Bible, uh, Jesus, uh, the psalm says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Landon, go to that, go to that verse for me. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's there for us. Jesus isn't trying to hide himself for you. You're here and he's making himself known. He is illuminating the path before you, but will you take the way of Jesus? This is not to scare you to Jesus. This is to show you what an incredible gift Jesus is in light of what is to come. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Land and pop it to there in John chapter 14. And so my question to you is, do you know Jesus? Do you know the reality of Jesus in light of what is to come? This is what we have talked about uh, so far, the three points. Jesus provides three key elements to our end times investigation. He provides the signs, the deeper studies, and the snapshot. My, my uh, son Landon is uh, in the back. He's the one doing the slides. And one of the things that my son and I love to do is when we're in the car, we love to listen uh, to comedy. Uh, and one of the comedians that we love to listen to because he's a cleaner comedian is a guy named Brian, uh, Brian Regan. Uh, and so one of his bits is, uh, is talking about how he's driving and he sees warning, warning signs while driving that, that are sometimes concerning. And he's like, I, I've been driving and I see a uh, blasting zone. And I, I saw this actually uh, when I was up in New Hampshire. I was driving around. And I saw a sign that said blasting zone. Uh, and his bit is, shouldn't it read road closed? Uh, and and he, so he's like, man, like uh, blasting zone, blasting zone. Like, oh, we lost Timmy, blasting zone. And he, he jokes about that. Like if there is a literal blasting zone that probably they should just close 
the road. And I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking about the tribulation, and I was thinking about the trajectory of humanity, and doesn't life kind of feel like a blasting zone right now? Doesn't life kind of feel like it's getting worse before it's getting easier? And sometimes life gets worse, but sometimes we're in a blasting zone because we've ignored warning signs. Sometimes we're in a blasting zone or just simply because we refuse to hear the people that are speaking loving truth to, to us. Sometimes we're in a blasting zone in life simply because of life. Because life does have its hardships. Sometimes we're in a blasting zone in our mind, but when we step back and really think about it, we feel worse than what is actually reality. Whatever your blasting zone might be, you want to know what I see more and more in 2022 through the hardships of life? This word right here. Can you relate to this either in your, in your own nature or with a loved one that's going through a hard time? Isolation. The process or fact of isolating or being isolated. Moving yourself from a situation because you think it will be easier. People in isolation, going through hard times, it's so much easier to deflect than to reflect. People that are in isolation are so good at blaming others while not being in the game themselves. People in isolation, they assume the strength of the group without wanting to be part of the group. People in isolation love the thought of people without actually loving people. And I'll be honest, life can get hard. And even, even in recent times, sometimes I want to say, this isn't a gift. <laughs> I want to run. I don't want to be around people because if I'm honest in myself, sometimes not being around the church seems like it might be easier in the moment. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus have gi has given us each other to walk through this hard life with. That it might be easier to isolate in the moment, but in the long run, it is not. And so life is a blasting zone. Life is heading in a trajectory where life is going to get harder and harder and harder. But it's the Christian who has peace in the midst of hardship. It's the Christian who has hope in the midst of hardship. And we need to remind each other of that, that we are better together than we are apart. The present is a present, and your presence in the present is a present. That is a grammatically correct sentence. Rewind the tape. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> One of our values that we wrote up to, to say this is what should be important to each Christian is pursuing community. I, I remember sitting with Josh and him saying that this is something that you need to pursue, that you need to go after. You're not expect it to come to you. <laughs> that we are pursuing what a, a community that is encouraging to my faith. You're here. Well done. You're watching online. I'll see you next week. <laughs> Here's my challenge to you as we go to two parts of this challenge. The, the first one is this, that, that we said we'll give the same challenge, but we'll apply it in different areas. Pursue community like he's coming tomorrow. The action step is to join a life group. And I am so pumped to announce this today that we are launching three new life groups in, in the coming weeks. Uh, that in the middle of September, we're launching a mom's life group. People have been talking about how, how hard it is to be a mom in 2022. And so Rebecca Pinkava, she is launching a mom's life group in the middle of September. Uh, for any mom that's really, it's going to be during the day on Thursdays, I think at 10 o'clock. If you're a mom in this room and you're like, I don't know how to get through it, please join that life group. On Wednesday nights, my wife, I'm going to be stepping in to help out with the youth group for a little bit. Uh, and my wife is going to, during that time, the co-ashes are going to come to the building. And uh, from 6.30, uh, my wife is going to be leading a co-ed life group uh, uh, someplace in the building. I don't really know. But she's going to be leading a co-ed life group starting September 7th on Wednesday nights. <laughs> Another life group is relaunching the Good Hue Life Group on Tuesday nights. Uh, that will be very kid-friendly, uh, and so if you have kids there, you can, you can enjoy the Good Hue Life Group and the chaos of having kids run around as you talk about Jesus. That's just real life. <laughs> and the Rajas have a life group. The Wilsons have a life group. And so I want to encourage you this week to sign up for a life group. The second one is, is this, uh, that, uh, that we would pray for one like it's the last one. Uh, if Jesus came back tonight, are we praying for one? Are we investing into the world around us to help them know and understand the gospel message of Jesus Christ and, and showing kindness to spark that conversation. 
Uh, the upcoming CK that Graham talked about, the race, I am super excited for. <laughs> Uh, I, we're, it's going to be a mess to park downtown, and we're going to have to fight to get into church because of the traffic. Uh, praise God for that. There's going to be literally a world outside our window uh, that we get to simply show love to. And so I pray that you will serve one, attend one. I remember when we made all those sandwiches for the, for the homeless uh, during our love weekend, uh, and, and a, a partner in our church said, don't hear what I'm not saying, but that was the best sermon ever preached at Wellspring. And I was like, no, I hear you, and you're absolutely right. The best thing that we can do on September 11th when this race is happening right outside our doors is to encourage one another, chew on God's word together, and then go and be the church and love the world around us. And so that Sunday, there will be a, a tent set up where we're going to have a kid's craft and give out Corona bars and water. We'll try to put people along the race uh, to be encouraging and cheer for them. Uh, and I'm going to run it at 10:10. 10, 10. Uh, and so cheer for me that I make it back to church if you come to the 11th service, that I make it back here. Uh, that will be fun. I'm going to preach real sweaty uh, and stinky, so don't talk to me afterwards. Uh, but all that to say is I hope that you sign up for one of these CKs or the, and or that you join a life group. And so I think we're ending with the cause of Christ. There's work to do. And in this song, there's a line that says, for this cause, I die. There will be a day where that will be a true reality. Jesus is worth it all. Let's stand and sing.